Hello friends. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how do you complete your AWS Cloud Practitioner certification without studying too much. So interested, just follow along. The course that you need to do is AWS Cloud Practitioner Essentials on the Explore Skill Builder AWS website, the URL that I'm showing right now. And the main thing is if you watch, if you enjoy watching Amazon Prime, I'm 100% sure you will enjoy doing this course. So even if you are a CEO of a startup company, the knowledge that is presented in this course will be of use to you because it takes a 10,000 feet high view and approaches a technical architecture from that perspective. So it covers all the technical, financial, operational aspects and gives you guiding principles. So how does, is the course structured? It is assuming that most of us in India will love having coffee or tea. So it gives us an example of a coffee shop. So just like a coffee shop has got people making coffee and serving coffee. And as the customers approach, there is a queue. So how AWS compares and reduces EC2 instances is as you get more customers, you add more EC2 instances. So that is dynamic auto scaling. And if the customers don't know where there is a less queue, you have elastic load balancers. So they will check where there is a less queue and guide the customers to the right queue. Oppose that is a notification service. So let's say a customer orders coffee. He needs to know by some SMS that your coffee is ready. So that can be an example of SNS. SQS means your applications should be decoupled. So if let's say a person who takes orders and the person who makes the coffee, they are tightly coupled with each other such that if the person who makes coffee just goes on a break and the person who is receiving your order just tries to wait till that person is back, then there will be nobody to pick orders, right? So the person who takes orders and the person who actually makes the coffee should be independent. So SQS is is like a buffer between them and that is the way modern applications should be architected. Then what is the global infrastructure? So let's say there is a heavy traffic on the road and people cannot approach your coffee shop. Let's say some political rally is going on. Let's say Bharat Jodo Andolan is going on. Then you should have your coffee shops at multiple locations so that you are not impacted by all these things because issues can happen anytime. And what is CloudFront? CloudFront is uh, just having content closer to the customer so that latency is avoided. Let's say, why should a customer who stays uh, nearby uh, go to a far away shop to fetch coffee? So you should be as close as possible to the customer. Then networking is also beautifully introduced. For example, uh, a person who is placing orders cannot interact with the person who is making the coffee directly. So that's like a kitchen area. So that should be somewhere secluded. So a person should interact only with the front office and then the front office uses SQS and gives the order to the back uh, portion or the coffee maker. So that is where networking comes in. You should have certain portions of your business which are accessible to the customers like your website, but your database should not be in a layer that is publicly accessible. So that's where you create a VPN and decide what should have a private versus a public facing scenario. And VPN is nothing but your dedicated network within AWS. And then there is a nice example of uh, difference between network access control list versus network security group. So network access control list is like checks at the uh, airports where people check you on arrival as well as departure. So they don't remember that this person is uh, so and so, etc. Whereas network security group is like your watchman at your building. So he will not check people who are leaving the building. So it doesn't check outgoing, but it only checks incoming. So while you are coming in, he will check if you have a valid ID card to enter the society or he will ask more details about you. So that's the difference between network access control list, which is a stateless, whereas network security group, it is stateful. And network access control list, it is at the subnet level, whereas your uh, uh, network security group is at the EC2 instance level. So that uh, is a difference that people will get a lot of questions on in the exam. And then various additional compute options for EC2, they are like different job profile. So based on what your jobs is, you have to have those kind of skill sets. So for example, it could be compute heavy or it could be CPU heavy. Like is your use case for gaming? Do you need a graphics card, etc. Accordingly, you need to choose the right compute options. So this is about the compute services at a high level. And the beauty is you don't have to go through the uh, video entirely. Once you complete the course, you can go through the important portions which are highlighted in the uh, subtext below it. And it talks about AWS Lambda in the end, which is serverless. So you pay only when you require to run a particular process. So that is the best uh, in class when it comes to computing. So then afterwards, it moves on to the databases and storage layer. So here there is a classic fight uh, in terms of WWF that we all watched as children, like which is the best storage? Is it S3? Is it EFS? So S3 is present, uh, is useful as a blocks, uh, sorry, as an object store. So where it stores the entire object together. And the, the uh, only issue is if you want to modify a small portion of the object, then you cannot because it, it writes the entire file. Whereas uh, in EFS, you can modify because it is a block storage. 
So depending on your use case, you need to select the right amount of storage. There is no best storage as such. Then RDS, if you have multiple tables and relationships that you need to create between multiple tables, DynamoDB is useful if you have single table as such and uh, you want to have rows in the table which can have different columns based on different rows. So for example, let's say it is a product and a product could be uh, uh, clothing. So in clothing, it will have attributes like a size, etc. Size, uh, color, th things like that. Whereas if it's a T, then there will be different attributes. So each attribute might be different. So then you might use DynamoDB. Redshift is about what happened in the past. If you need to check that or run analytics, uh, then you need to use Redshift. Whereas AWS, uh, RDS, etc. is mostly for front-end uh, web websites uh, and relationships. Dy dy dynamic management service is for migrating data between different AWS uh, as well as on-prem or between AWS uh, RDS instances themselves. It also has a schema conversion tool. So it can migrate from one RDBMS platform to another and whatever it can't migrate that you have to do it manually. And then uh, also about different AWS database services like how do you do caching and things like that. So it talks about document DB, which is uh, for uh, large documents, Amazon, Neptune, Quantum, QLDB, Blockchain and Dy DynamoDB Accelerator. So overall it talks uh, about all the essential uh, database uh, parts. Then in the security, what you need to remember is security is a shared responsibility between AWS because AWS is responsible for the perimeter like um, securing your physical infrastructure themselves, the data centers, but you have to define the right IAM roles uh, because and then you have to also ensure that you don't have open access, you have to configure your network, you have to patch your operating system if you are having uh, EC2 instances, but if it is a a database RDS, then you don't have to patch the operating system. Then you just need to tell AWS what is a good time to patch the operating system and AWS will do the patching themselves. And in organizations, it helps you map your billing based on multiple units. So let's say you have five business units and you don't want, and there are five heads. So you can create uh, organizations and group multiple business units, apply policies which are similar. So let's say compliance and finance has similar business uh, policies, then you can group them together and you can have consolidated billing. So instead of getting 10 different bills, you can get a single bill. So I mean, all those features are available. Then it talks about uh, different uh, DDoS, denial of service attacks, etc. How do you prevent? So I will come to that uh, later. And from a monitoring perspective, CloudWatch is for uh, getting alerted about uh, high usage, etc. Metrics, dashboard, and it is a real time. Whereas CloudTrail is about API, who, what, when, any unusual activity. Then AWS uh, Trusted Advisor. This is something uh, which is my favorite and you have to really learn, learn it well. Uh, what AWS Trusted Advisor does is it uh, like helps you or advises you on five different areas and it gives you green, orange and uh, red ticks. So first area is cost optimization. So for example, if you have low utilization of certain EC2 instances uh, or EBS, etc., it will tell you. So AWS is actually helping you even though uh, they are fee might get reduced because you will end up downsizing the instance, but still they will tell you from a cost optimization perspective. Uh, performance, it tells you if a throughput of an EBS instance, etc. is good or not good. Third part is security, where it tells you if you have implemented MFA on the root account, how is your password policy, is your uh, public access still enabled, etc. Uh, on certain resources. And the fourth point is fault tolerance. So it will tell you if an EBS volume has been created without a snapshot, EC2 is uh, not present in multiple AWS uh, AZs, etc. So it may not be enough fault tolerance in the system. So it will highlight that. Service limits, it is going to tell you if uh, you are reaching some soft limits for a certain AWS services. So those are the five pillars. Just to repeat again, cost optimization, performance, security. So these three are like most common, right? Cost, everybody wants to save on cost. Performance, sub cost, performance. And security, uh, you need to Without security, nothing works. It's like a day zero kind of a concern. And uh, fault tolerance and service limits, that's what you need to remember. So just remember which are the five uh, different sections under AWS Advisor. And then there are uh, summary under each and obviously quizzes there that gives you a good uh, confidence. It's quizzes like very easy. I never got any question wrong. So I mean, it is that easy uh, when it comes to this particular exam. Then it talks about the different pricing tiers like the free tier, etc. And then about the support plan. So here support plan is something that is important. So support plan, what we have to remember is there is a basic support plan that is uh, required for everybody. So now the support plan, uh, the definitions in the course I did not find it complete. I had to go to the website, but you don't need to go to the website. So what you do is you just listen uh, through this course and whatever I'm telling you in this video, and that should be enough for you to clear the exam. So that is the overall scenario. I mean, support plan, what you need to remember is basic plan is free for everybody. Okay. And then the developer plan comes in the developer plan. What you can do, you can reach to AWS via email only. Whereas in the business plan, you can reach to them via 24 seven phone support as well. In addition to the email, obviously developer say better plan hai business and better than business is enterprise on the ramp and the best plan is obviously enterprise okay but enterprise since it is best it is the most costly also so if you are initially starting off with aws you can try basic then once you mature you can go for a developer once you go live you can go for business and once your business scales you can go for enterprise or the app or enterprise 
then in terms of uh, the aws trusted advisor that i spoke about what comes in the developer plan is just the service quota limits if you are nearby and the basic security check well, security is most important so that comes in the developer plan whereas the full trusted advisor is available in the business enterprise on ramp and enterprise layers uh, unfortunately this course doesn't talk about enterprise on ramp so probably that got introduced after the course got created then another important point to note is how fast will aws reply to you if you are on the developer plan then there's a 12 hour sla if you system goes down and like worst things happen to you your system still 12 hours aws might take to reply to you so that is not uh, good if you want better sla but developer na so you are not live that is the assumption probably uh, then the, in the business plan one hour aws will reply back to you so that is a good thing enterprise on ramp cut it down to 30 minutes so like it remind me of 30 minutes night so free that kind of uh, thing and if you are an enterprise then it it really aws replies to you in just 15 minutes sla if your system is down so that is phenomenal i mean uh, then infrastructure event management team there is a team for infrastructure event management so let's say if you are doing some sales promotion let's say you want to give some big discount today like amazon uh, flipkart billion dollar sale amazon billion dollar sale etc whatever so then you can consult the infra man event management team for a fee in the uh, business plan so from business plan onwards you have the infra man event management team available to you then uh, uh, how let's say if you don't know aws much then if you are on a developer support plan you can get general architecture guidance if you are on a business plan you can get contextual guidance on your use case specific so you can ask them specific questions and obviously in the enterprise plan you will get a tam with the technical account manager who is a consultant based for your applications so dedicated tam will be available many of my friends uh, who are working in aws have a tam designation also so that is the difference uh, between these three plans and all that uh, you need to specifically know from a support perspective so now you don't have to waste uh, then another thing is caf aws cloud adoption framework so what is cloud adoption framework there are just too many frameworks but uh, i mean yeah they can ask questions on cloud adoption framework so there are six pillars in the cloud adoption framework uh, one uh, is a business second is people and third is governance okay fourth is platform fifth is security sixth is operations so let me tell you in detail business mein who is a part of the business uh, cloud adoption framework obviously your finance team because they are from the business finance and etc people who will come hr that they are in the people like is it good from a people perspective let's say people are uh, is it going to cause any impact on the policies etc the governance perspective cio program manager all people who are governing they are in the governance framework now these business people and the governance they come under the business capabilities umbrella and platform security and operations they come under the tech umbrella who comes under platform cto cloud architect who comes under security ciso security manager and in the operations it is the it ops so these six things you need to know from a cloud adoption framework perspective then what else there are migration strategies so in migration strategy the only thing that is important is the six r's okay so what are the six r's rehost that is first so in the rehost what you do lift and shift just pick up from your on prem and shift to cloud you may not get all the benefits but at least now you can put on your resume that you are in the cloud and the company see can tell the board also that uh, we are using cloud because board will they will or ceo will also be answerable then second uh, r is uh, replatforming so let's say you are moving from mysql to uh, mysql rds aurora or aurora aurora is compatible like it's a aws uh, database and it is compatible with mysql and so in this case replatforming the main thing is no code change so look for no code change in the question if it says no code change you have to choose replatforming okay rehosting was simple lift and shift replatforming is a one step further you uh, go you don't do have a ec to so in a rehost you will typically use ec2 instances and install your mysql whereas in a replatforming you will probably use an rds kind of a solution third is retire and fourth is retain now in retire and retain retire you don't put put the system anywhere you just shut down your server which is on prem and in the retain you keep on prem itself and assume that in future this application will not be required so these two retain and retire they don't involve a migration to the cloud fifth is repurchase in repurchase you move uh, let's say your crm to a saas based application so repurchase so that involves some cost implications so you modernize your application in a repurchase and last is a refactor so repurchase may there is a financial angle involved but you may not need to build everything whereas in a refactor last r you have to rewrite and refactor may there is the highest initial cost because you have to rearchitect redesign everything but refactor will give you the biggest a buck for your money because you will be able to modernize your application from a rearchitecting uh, rearchitecting perspective so that and then what is the uh what else is remaining so let me tell walk you through my notes also which i had prepared uh, while i was studying so i used uh, some of the uh, so cloud watch so what is cloud watch so it is it gives you metrics it gives you dashboard and it is a real time what is the cloud trail it gives you apis uh, tracking and it is more important from a security perspective unusual activity so then you go for a cloud trail what is a guard duty guard duty is about intelligent threat detection so it guard so obviously threat detection you come to know then what is the aws cost explorer 
Cost Explorer helps you visualize, understand and manage AWS cost and usage over time. So it gives you 12 months data and it gives you a custom report also. Then another thing that we have not covered yet is well-architected framework. It also has a green, orange, red, just like your AWS trusted advisor. Well-architected framework also has these three buckets. And what is there? There are three overlaps like uh, security, reliability and performance. As I told you, uh, they will come here also. Sorry, security, performance and cost optimization. Reliability is new over here. So performance may, it will track things like, have you, are you using the right EC2 instance type? Can you, if you go to the serverless, so let's say in exam, if you get a question, we are migrating to serverless, let's say. So then that means you are uh, creating performance efficient architectures, something like a glow global in minutes. So that is also performance, F, performance efficient because you are able to go glow global in minutes. So that is coming under the performance efficiency tire. Then if you check security, things like encryption, etc. will come under security. What comes under cost optimization? Have you overestimated uh, your infrastructure? Uh, then that is under it. Secondly, uh, it will analyze your expenditure. Thirdly, can you use managed services to reduce your total TCO? So that comes under the cost optimization thing. And under operational excellence, what comes is you respond to alerts to improve uh, continuously. You anticipate failures and you make small changes. You use uh, automation in your deployment pipelines. So operationally, you are doing the right things. So that's under operational and in reliability, your last which is there. That is taking care about recovery and planning, uh, scaling in, scaling out, etc. Scale outs basically. And that is here also scale outs, horizontal scale out. So that is a reliability pillar that helps you plan under the well-architected framework. So if you're following these policies, then you can say it is a well-architected. Now, what is the AWS marketplace? It's a click and go service where you can find and test and buy software running on AWS. So let's say you had a vendor who gave you on-premise solution. Now you move to cloud. So your vendor will also be on cloud. Let's say uh, antivirus, McAfee, etc. So that will be available in the AWS marketplace. What is consolidated billing? It combines usage across accounts to get volume price discounts. So let's say you have uh, HR and you have marketing and let's say there is a discount from AWS if you use uh, 100 hours of time, just hypothetically. Now, if marketing is using 60, HR is using uh, 50. So in total, they are using 110, 60 plus 50. But in single, singularly, they were not using above 100. So AWS passes on consolidated billing discounts also. So both entities subscriptions can combine and apply for consolidated billing. How much discount they will get is based on the proportion. So whichever business unit is using more of uh, the AWS within that like 60, 50. So 60 value ko discount uh, it will get. AWS budget. So it reviews how much cost you are predicted and AWS usage will, uh, how much it is incurring for the month. So that is the budgeting. So you have to predict and then set alerts. Like if it is going more than the forecast or the actual, then you get alerted. You create estimates uh, of cost for your use case using AWS pricing calculator. So before starting the project, you use the pricing calculator to decide how much uh, expenses you may have to incur. Whereas once your project has started, then real time, whatever you have to check actuals, that is the AWS budget. So from there, you will get alerts. Now, uh, another thing is AWS CAF, so cloud adoption framework. Ye, I think we already covered this, like uh, three perspectives in the business tier and three perspectives in the tech tier. Now, there are uh, there is some, something which is important from a storage perspective. What that is, AW, if you want to move large amount of data my for migration into AWS cloud, you use the snow cone, which is AWS uh, snow cone and its capacity is 80 terabytes. Snowball edge capacity, eight terabytes. Sorry, snow cone capacity is eight, whereas snowball edge capacity is 80. So see that 10x capacity increase and snowball edge, it is, all, it, it is available in two flavors, storage optimized and compute optimized. And biggest one is a snowmobile, which is a hundred petabytes. So you have to just remember these sizes like snow cone eight, snowball edge 80 and snowmobile hundred petabytes. Then another tip is to remember some of these services, uh, typically AI services, because AI ka zamana hai, so AI services just uh, note down, like uh, transcribe, what does it do? Speech to text, in Teams also you have, right? Transcribe on, so you can remember that way, transcription is on. So speech, it converts into text. Comprehend, comprehend what does it do? It discover pattern in the text, okay? That is a thing and uh, there is Amazon fraud detector that is detecting any frauds, etc. Then there is a Lex. Lex, you know, it is a base for Amazon Alexa, Lex, it comes from there and it can create voice and text chatbots. Next one is text track. Text track will extract text and data from scanned document. So name may come, text track, either you come to know it is an extracting thing. Depressor, it is for reinforcement learning. Document DB, it is a content management system and it has a compatibility with a MongoDB, okay? Then sustainability pillar. So this pillar is not present in this particular course, but it is present on the website. So while I was studying from the website also, I found this out. So you need not waste your time going through the website unless you want to uh, study more thoroughly or create your own YouTube video. So sustainability pillar, what it talks about is you reduce the downstream impact uh, of uh, whatever business you are doing. So you, for example, you can use managed services, adopt newer offerings, uh, run at maximum utilization, like don't provision a larger server if you don't need it, etc. So that way sustainability generally now is a part of ESG. 
Uh, then uh, what are the benefits? So that is uh, interesting. The first chapter also and the last chapter also. So probably it is more important. Hence they are covering it twice in the course. So benefits for AWS, they will ask you which is the right benefit. So first benefit is trade upfront expense for variable because if you are investing in a data center, you have to uh, waste, a, you have to spend a lot of money. So if your business is a failure, that all money probably is lost. So it doesn't allow you to fail. Whereas in a variable expense, you spin up and quickly spin down, do experiments. Second benefit is massive economies of scale so because AWS purchase is the hardware. It will get it much cheaper, right? You know, if you go to DMART, why do you get things cheap as compared to your local Kirana wala because demand purchases in bulk samely AWS purchases this hardware from hardware manufacturers in bulk and they pass a lot of this discount to you third point is stop guessing capacity because capacity planning you cannot actually decide you can either be over capacity because on one particular day or like your big billion dollar sale you will get a lot of customers but if you have lesser hardware you cannot actually accommodate for that day and just if you provision for that day the other 364 days you will be uh, under utilizing your capacity so in the on prem it is not at all possible to right size it is possible only in the cloud fourth advantage is increasing speed and agility because you can try out services, it will be much easier rather than coding and like some people have invented things, it will be on the marketplace. So you need not uh, waste time in trying out. Uh, just like for example, when it comes to AI, I don't really start coding on my own. I check what is the state of the art that is available in AWS or uh, Azure already. And then if it is serving my needs, then probably I can uh, code something in let's say TensorFlow, etc. or modify things. So it allows you to increase your speed and agility. Fifth is stop maintaining data centers because data center maintenance is not your particular competence. Like no uh, large company is known to be great just because it is maintaining data centers. Data center maintenance is outsourced to AWS, whereas the actual data um, in the table, like installing, uh, let's say, a SQL server is not your company's core competence. But doing analytics, capturing the right data will help you create better customer experiences. And the last point is grow global in minutes. So you can use edge locations, you can spin up instances in different locations. Uh, so it will help you expand. So now there are a lot of mergers and acquisitions going on, even startups uh, in India are acquiring organizations in Europe, etc. So it will help them go low global and reach uh, wherever their customers are present. So in summary, just do this course, listen to my video in audio only mode, uh, especially if you find it boring, you can listen to while you're going to sleep. And uh, you need to study only for a week and there are no practical questions. So no need to spend time doing any practicals. And if you have any comments, do let me know and I'll try and answer to them or cover them in my next video. Thank you.